Respected Palkhiwala Ji, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great privilege to welcome you all and Honorable Shri Palkhiwala, our distinguished guest speaker for today, to this year's this Sardar Patel Memorial Lecture. Archives recording. Normally, these lectures are delivered on two consecutive days. But this year, on the suggestion of Mr. Palkhiwala, we shall have it concluded in one session. Sadar Patel, besides his major portfolio of home affairs, was Free India's first Minister for Information and Broadcasting. All India Radio introduced this series of lectures in 1955, dedicated to the memory of the great leader. Patel Memorial Lectures, year after year, have dealt with subjects of great public importance and have promoted discussion on contemporary issues. The first lecture was delivered by late Sri Raj Achari, who spoke on good administrator. In the following years, eminent persons have spoken on a variety of subjects. The choice of the subject is left entirely to the speaker. The lectures delivered by these eminent speakers over the past three decades or so have covered a vast range of subjects such as education, communication, religion, art, culture, secular values, science and technology, law and the constitution, philosophy, etc., etc. We are grateful to Sri Nani Palkiwala for agreeing to deliver this year's lecture. Sri Palkiwala had chosen Enduring Relevance of Sardar Patel as the theme of his lecture. On behalf of DGAR, I welcome you, sir, and request you to deliver your lecture. Mr. Lele, this is all and India distinguished Radio Archives citizens, recording. I feel privileged and honored to have been asked to deliver the Sardar Patel lecture this year. As you have been already told, the series started in 1955 with the inaugural lecture by no less a person than Raja Gopalachari. And a number of subjects have been touched upon by the speakers in the last 40 years. I thought having regard to the state of our democracy at present, no subject would be of greater appropriateness and relevance than the enduring relevance of Sardar Patel. More than ever before, we need to recall what he stood for and what he tirelessly strove to achieve. My life is my message, said Mahatma Gandhi, and the same could have been said by Sadar Patel. To question the enduring relevance of Sadar Patel to India today is like questioning the relevance of the sun to the solar system. You cannot conceive of a solar system without the sun, and you cannot conceive of modern India without Sadar Patel. In recent history, two events have thrown up a striking galaxy of talent. The first was when the 13 colonies in America were fighting for their independence. This is From All 1776 to 1783, the United States of America, as it came to be known later, produced an extraordinary cluster of outstanding men who were the founders of the great republic. In the 25 years of India's history, between 1922 and 1947, India had a comparable galaxy of talent no inferior to that which America produced. 
and our leaders in those days combined talent with sterling character. Undoubtedly, Sardar Patel was in the top rank. The Sardar was one of the founders of our constitution. Luckily, the constitution was drafted by the Constituent Assembly, which was not elected on the basis of adult franchise. First-rate minds were handpicked from different parts of India for their knowledge, vision, and dedication. After three years of laborious and painful toil, they completed the drafting of the Constitution, which a former Chief Justice of India rightly described as sublime. This adjective was used for our Constitution by Merch and Marjan, to my mind one of the greatest judges who ever sat in India. It was the longest constitution in the world till the new constitution of Yugoslavia came into force a few years before the dismemberment of that ill-starred country. Consider the sharp contrast between India in 1947 and the British colonies in America after their successful war of independence. I'm deliberately taking the instance of the USA because we too are the largest democracies in the world. The USA 13 colonies started with every conceivable disadvantage. They were just a loose alliance of 13 colonies bended together by Articles of Confederation. The 13 colonies had no unified nationality, no head of state, no central government, no central judiciary, no common system of taxation, and no national currency. On these six points, we had positive advantages as compared to their disadvantages. In the summer of 1787, the delegates in Philadelphia drafted a document only seven articles long, which, with its 27 amendments, has lasted more than two centuries and continues to be the fundamental law of the world's most powerful democracy. Let me pause here for a moment at the time when there is continuous talk about amendment of the Constitution. The USA Constitution is just seven articles long as compared to our 400 articles and a number of schedules. It has lasted for 205 years, this is all India but Radio it has been Archives amended recording. only 27 times. And if I had been speaking to you five months ago, I would have said 26 times because one amendment came only four months ago, which merely curtailed the powers of members of the, uh, of the Congress to, to vote certain measures and make certain expenditures. We have amended our Constitution 71 times. The last amendment was made only this month when Nepalis was introduced as, the, as one of the major languages of India. The story of Sardar Patel's life is easily told. The traditional date of his birth is 31st October, 1875. But really speaking, nobody knows the exact date on which he was born. The traditional date, 31st October, is what he gave for his matriculation examination and he never changed it. Rather typical of the constancy which characterized his mental makeup. Sardar Patel was born to parents who were deeply religious. It is remarkable how frequently the children of deeply religious parents fare well in life. Wallabha himself became the architect of modern India. 
while his brother Vithalbhai became the first speaker of the central legislature. Vallabhai was a very affectionate man, though there were not many occasions when he displayed his affectionate nature. He had a very fine sense of humor. Mahatma Gandhi has this gone on record to say that recording. during the 16 months when he was in jail, he was kept in peals of laughter by Vallabhai, who was a co-inmate in the jail. Vallabhai never courted publicity. He never projected himself anywhere, but quietly did his work. He was a true karma yogi. After he became a widower at the age of 33, the only love in his life was his motherland, to which he was passionately devoted. Sardar Patel had three great ambitions. First of all, he wanted to consolidate India. In the 5,000 years of its history, India was never united. It had always been a group of different states. Vallabhai wanted to bring into existence a united, homogeneous India when it became a republic in 1950. You will recall how there were 554 Indian states which occupied two-thirds of India and one-third of India was British India. So the one-third British India and two-thirds, the 554 states, had all to be brought together and made into one single country. The Times of London, after which our Times is named, the Times of London said, that Vallabhai's achievement of the integration of the Indian states would rank with that of Bismarck and probably higher. The Manchester Guardian rightly said, without Patel, Gandhi's idea would have had less practical recording. influence and Nehru's idealism less scope. Patel was not only the organizer of the fight for freedom, but also the architect of the new state when the fight was over. The same man is seldom successful as rebel and statesman. Sadar Patel was the exception." Unquote. While launching the Pepsu Union at Patiala, Sadar Patel said, this is the first time in history after centuries that India can call itself an integrated whole in the real sense of the term. We must work with unity. If we falter or fail, we shall consign ourselves to eternal shame and disgrace. His second ambition was to ensure the survival of a united country through the instrument of a strong civil service. He conceived of the Indian Administrative Service, IAS, in place of the Indian Civil Service, ICS. And it was he who also conceived of the Indian Police Service, IPS. Both these services, IAS and IPS, are very much extant today and have enabled India to survive as a democratic state while the fortunes of political parties keep changing. Here I would like to mention how glad I am that the All India Radio, year after year, is having this kind of memorial lecture. It's a tribute which all of India must pay to the great Sardar. But as I shall point out from passages this is all quoted India from Radio Indian statesmen recording. and politicians, it is surprising how little this country is grateful to Sardar for what he has done. Without Sardar Patel, there would be no India today. You can take it as gospel truth. His third ambition was to make India economically strong, prosperous, and progressive. This ambition was not fulfilled. After the death of Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel, he died on the 15th December 1950. 
the government consciously discarded the economic policies of the Sardar and adopted a sterile form of socialism, which was the bane of India till the present government started its new policy of liberalization. The nation has not realized the greatness of Sardar Patel as it should have done. If Vallabhbhai had not lived, India would not be what it is today. He aimed at integration in two ways. Not only territorial integration, but the integration of the different communities by developing a sense of national identity. There were 554 Indian states which comprised two-thirds of India, while one-third was British India, as I've already said. He brought all of them together while continuing to remain on terms of mutual affection and respect with the former rulers. When the Russian leader Khrushchev visited India in 1956, he expressed surprise that India had managed to liquidate the princely states without liquidating the princes. This is All India Radio in Archives USSR report. in those days, the princes would have been liquidated first, then the states. Sardar Patel was also the chairman of the minority subcommittee of the Constituent Assembly. To his work as the chairman of the subcommittee of the for the minorities, I attach very great importance. Because today when we have these fissiparous tendencies, when communities feel alienated from the mainstream of our national life, it is necessary to recall how statesmanlike Sardar Patel was. He had the same problems that we are having now. The Muslims feeling that they are not being well treated. The Sikhs feeling that they have no place in a unified country. And I, instead of saying now, I shall come to the precise instances where he used his influence to ensure that India remain one. He made different communities give up their claim for separate electorates. Even the spokesmen of the Parsis had in mind a separate electorate. But Wallabai merely smiled at the ridiculous idea, and the matter was not discussed again. The Parsis are a microscopic minority, but the Muslims, the Sikhs, and the Christians were in substantial numbers. Even in those days, the Sikhs demanded Khalistan. Sadar Patel dealt with the problem with great understanding. He went to the heart of the Sikh hinterland. He talked to the Sikhs in Amritsar and impressed upon them how we all have to live together as brothers and sisters. As was said on a previous historic occasion, we either have to hang together or hang this is separately. All India Radio Archives recording. The passionate plea of Sardar Patel worked. In a powerful speech he made at Patiala in October 1947, he said that we should not involve ourselves in endless disputes and that we could not afford to follow the mirage of stans like Khalistan, Sikhistan, Jatistan. He pointed out that such separatism would only turn India into Pagalistan, the land of lunatics. <laughs> he was a true leader in the sense that he did not flatter the people, but plainly told them where they were wrong. This is very important. A nation marches forward when it has the moral leadership of individuals who are not afraid to speak bluntly and speak forthright and tell the people where they are wrong. It's no use merely pampering people and telling them how great they are and how great their democracy is. Lee Kuan Yew dealt with that problem once when in, in, the, in Singapore he had people who had the courage to speak the blunt truth. And he said, we need such people who are movers of people, mobilizers of opinion. And Sardar Patel was truly a mover of people, a mobilizer of opinion. In August 1947, 
He said again in ringing words how and why India could not be divided. And his words are very beautiful. I would like to quote them. He said, India is one and indivisible. You cannot divide the sea or split the running waters of a river. He said this, this not merely to the Muslims and to the Sikhs, but to the Hindus themselves. When the RSS made a strong plea that India should become a Hindu state. His words were to the RSS, we in government have been dealing with the RSS movement. They want that Hindu Rajya or Hindu culture should be imposed by force. No government can tolerate this. Wallabai was not against anybody except the fanatic. If you were a fanatic, he was against you, whether you were a Hindu or a Muslim or a Sikh. And I come to a very important point. It is wrong to portray him as being anti-Muslim. Wallabai, as the Home Minister, had the courage to ban the RSS. Only twice in India's history, the RSS has been banned. The first time was done by Sardar Wallabai Patel. Imagine a man who is wrongly called anti-Muslim, banning the RSS. Why? Because he didn't want fanaticism anywhere. He did not want fanatical Hindus. He did not want fanatical Muslims. He did not want fanatical Sikhs. And the second time it was banned was during the emergency, uh, when for other reasons the ban had come. That conclusively shows how totally secular and non-communal Sardar Patel was in his approach. He told the Hindu Mahasabha, in those days the Mahasabha was the very powerful Hindu body. He told them, I quote, if you think that you are the only custodians of Hinduism, you are mistaken. Hinduism preaches a broader outlook on life. There is much more of tolerance in Hinduism than is supposed. This is, all this is a very important point. Recording. I think all scholars are agreed that there has never been a religion in the world broader or more Catholic in its outlook than Hinduism. It is a most tolerant religion. That's why every single faith, every single religion has flourished in India. Every single one without exception. That in his speech in January 1948 in, at Calcutta, Sardar Patel warned the country that there could never be any serious talk of a Hindu state. India had elected to be a secular state. He solemnly declared, if the government could not act as trustees for the entire population, irrespective of caste, religion, or creed, it does not deserve to continue for a single day. I quoted his exact words. In 1947, when we attained independence, when people were jubilant that we attained Swaraj, there were two persons who struck a note of dissent. Mahatma Gandhi and Sardar Patel. The response of Sardar Patel to independence gain in 47 was memorable. Here are words which I've quoted, which I think ought to be taught in every school and college. Everyone must know what the greatest thinkers of India have thought about Swaraj. What we have is not Swaraj, but only freedom from foreign rule. The people have still to win internal Swaraj, abolish distinctions of caste or creed, banish untouchability, improve the lot of the hungry masses, and live as one joint family. In short, to create a new way of life and bring about a change of heart and a change this of is outlook. All India Radio archives Unquote. recording. To Sardar Patel, the unity and integrity of India was of paramount importance. He shared the view of the Indian thinker who, when he was told that the British divide and rule, gave the profound response, no, it is not the British who divide and rule, it is we who divide and they rule. That is why he was against the creation of linguistic states. In December 1949, 
the working committee of the Congress directed that a separate Andhra state should be created forthwith. This is a very important historical incident. The Congress is at the helm of affairs. It is in power in Delhi. It passes a resolution saying, create a separate state of, called Andhra, Andhra state, separate from Madras. Sardar Patel was a home minister. It was his duty then to ensure that the thing was done. But Sardar Patel took no action. On the contrary, he criticized openly this directive of his own party. At a public meeting in Trivandrum in May 1950, he said, quote, some people say they want provinces on a linguistic basis, like Andhra, Tamil, and Kerala. What will be its effect in the north and in the west, nobody cares to consider. We should cease to think in terms of different states or provinces. Instead, we should think that we are Indians and should develop a sense of unity." Unquote. While the unification and integration of India was his greatest achievement, only next in importance was his creation of a strong and independent recording. civil service. He trusted and respected the officers in the civil service and gained their affection and deep regard. This put the civil servants on their honor to work for him to the limit of their capacity and never, as far as humanly possible, to let him down. H. V. R. Iyengar, one of our ablest civil servants, has written a book called Administration in India, a historical review. And in that book, Mr. Iyengar quotes this very interesting incident. On one occasion, says Iyengar, I took a decision in his absence and reported it to him afterwards. He told me if he had been consulted, he would not have taken that decision. I was very unhappy about this, but he asked me not to worry and said that every human being makes mistakes. When the matter subsequently came before the cabinet, he told them that the decision was his, and there the matter ended. This is an incident worth remembering, how a minister would shield his civil servant, not the other way about as sometimes happens, that you try to see that the blame attaches to the civil servant. He said, this is my decision, and Mr. H. V. R. Iyengar was that way safeguarded, but really the decision was not his. In Sardar Patel's words, the most dangerous thing in a democracy is to interfere with the services. If today the police force is wholly demoralized in most states, it is entirely due to the political interference by ministers and other politicians in the discharge by the police of their professional duties. The greatest tragedy of India has been that Sardar Patel's economic policies were not Radio implemented. His realism and pragmatism in economic matters were foolishly ignored after his death, as I've said earlier. Sardar Patel never posed as a socialist. He had no property of his own, except his personal belongings. Once an ardent socialist approached him with an appeal to abolish inequality of wealth and cited as an instance that one Mr. X was master of several millions. The Sardar let him expatiate on the distribution of surplus wealth. When he had finished, Sardar coolly looked at him and said, I know the extent of Mr. X's wealth. If all of it were distributed equally among the people of India, your share would be about four annas and three pies. I am willing to give it to you from my own pocket if you undertake to talk no more about it. <laughs> he wanted to purge capitalism of its ugly face, but he realized that wealth has to be created first before it can be distributed. So long as Sardar Patel was alive, there was no nationalization. He said, I quote, 
some people want us to nationalize all industry. How are we to run nationalized industries if we cannot run our ordinary administration? It is easy to take over any industry we want to, but we do not have the resources to run them. Not enough experienced men, not enough men of expertise and integrity. This is all Sardar India Patel Radio started the recording. Indian National Trade Union Congress, INTUC, because he wanted a fair deal to be given to labor. But he was not in the popularity contest and he had no patience with people who were. He was against the mindless calls for strikes made by trade union leaders who live in a thought-free zone. He said in Calcutta in January 1948, I quote, regarding strikes, I feel that it is deplorable that they have become so cheap. They are now props of leadership of labor and have ceased to be a legitimate means of redressing grievances of labor. The maxim should be produce and then distribute equitably. Instead, they fight before even producing wealth. It is to restore sanity and a fair deal between labor and employers and to give a correct lead to labor that we set up the Indian National Trade Union Congress. Of course, the objective is for you to consider whether today the objective is being achieved and served. Now I come to one aspect which is, to my mind, very important. Value which a nation attaches to its own word. I am a great believer, like Sardar Patel, in never breaking your word. To Sardar Patel, the plighted word was sacred. He never broke his word. He had a sense of honor and good faith, which successive governments so sadly lacked. He never dreamed that the promise contained in Article 291 of the Constitution to give privy purses to the princes would this be broken is later. All India Radio I must recording. tell you a few words about two articles which I'm going to deal with now, 291 and 314. Article 291 said that the princes shall be given privy purses. And those privy purses came to an amount of less than five crores of rupees. If a prince died, his privy purse would be given to his successor. But the government had the right to reduce that privy purse when the successor began to be the recipient. And as a matter of fact, every single successor got a lower privy purse than his father or his, uh, his ancestor did. Now, two things were there in 291. One, the privy purse was guaranteed on the Consolidated Fund of India. This is the highest guarantee known to law. If your salary is guaranteed and secured by the Consolidated Fund of India, you can file a suit and get a, a decree in your favor, whatever may be the other conditions and other uh, circumstances. And the second thing which was said in Article 291 was, that the privy purse would be free from taxation. Article 314 said that those who were the ICS officers would be given the same pension which had been assured to them by the British government. There were less than 70 ICS officers left at the time which I'm dealing with. So the pension came to a negligible, a ridiculous amount compared to the actual amount of expenditure by the union government. And one must remember that but for the ICS officers like H.V.R. Iyengar, whom I've quoted before, L.K. Ja, both of whom are unfortunately dead, Mr. H.M. Patel, who is luckily still with us, and Mr. B.K. Nehru, this who is, is again luckily India still Radio with us. I'm recording. just quoting at random these four names. These people really saved India during the years 47 to 49 when there were the partition riots. Because the politicians were very busy with the constitution. The constitution was being drafted. And no one had any time to, to take care of the, uh, of the millions of refugees. As you remember, not less than one million citizens died in those really unbelievable riots which broke out. 
there were massacres, literal massacres. But it was these ICS officers who ruled the country at that time and took care of that terrible situation. Now the, the pension was guaranteed to them. What did it matter? But that, and mind you, it was guaranteed by Article 314, as 291 guaranteed the privy purse. Yet, the then government abolished privy purses, disregarding the constitutional mandate. This was done in 1971 by the 26th Constitution Amendment Act, the abolition of the privy purses by deleting Article 291. Then I come to Article 314, which I've already referred to, the pensions of the ICS officers. At the time when this Article 314 was sought to be introduced in the Constitution, a debate took place in the Constituent Assembly. And even in that debate, some people said, why give a guarantee? Who are you to give a guarantee? It is for Parliament to decide. If tomorrow Parliament decides to abolish the pensions, they would have to be abolished. Why do you give a guarantee? And some of them categorically said, who is the Constituent Assembly to give a guarantee? It is to be left to successive parliaments to decide whatever way they like. This is all India and these are Sardar Patel's recorded words, referring to the guarantee regarding pensions to the covenanted services, which was to be embodied in Article 314. Sardar Patel said in the Constituent Assembly, on 10th October 1949, I quote, Have you read history? Or is it that you do not care for recent history after you've begun to make history yourself? If you do that, then I tell you we have a dark future. Learn to stand upon your pledged word. Can you go behind these things? Have morals no place in the new parliament? Is that how we are going to begin our new freedom? Do not take a lathe and say, who is to give a guarantee? We are a supreme parliament. Have you supremacy for that kind of thing? To go behind your word? If you do that, that supremacy will go down in a few days." Unquote. I wish more leaders would have the courage to say bluntly what this great man did in the Constituent Assembly. Like Article 291, Article 314 was also brazenly deleted after the Sardar's death. It was deleted in 1972 by the 28th Constitution Amendment Act. And as you will recall, Sardar died in December 1950. In 1950, the last year of his life, Sardar Patel repeatedly expressed his total disillusionment with the debased standards of politicians and the malfunctioning of Indian democracy. This is very significant and very important. We are still in the very first year of our democracy. And look at what honest, morally aroused leaders Radio thought of the way recording. we function. Even in the very first year. Imagine what Salapate would have felt if he looked at the standards prevailing today. On 27th May, 1950, that is just six months before his death, he spoke at Porbandar, the hometown of Mahatma Gandhi, in a mood of introspection. And he said, we have not digested uh, Gandhiji's teachings. We are merely imitating. We have adult franchise, but do not know how to use it. If we continue to indulge in personal jealousies and power hunting, we shall turn into poison what Gandhiji has got for us. During the last three years, we have worked in a manner which has brought us only shame. We have strayed from the right road and must get back to it and understand Gandhiji's teachings and apply them in life. This is interesting. He points out that we have adult franchise, but we don't know how to use it. And that reminds me of, a, of an American thinker who said that the success of a democracy depends upon an informed citizenry and not upon the participation of every inmate in the asylum. <laughs> the last Independence Day message which Sardar Patel delivered 
was on 15th August 1950. He didn't know he would be dead in three months' time. But before I read that message, I would just like to draw your attention to the fact that one of the wisest and greatest Indians of our century was C. Raja Gopalachari. And he writes in his prison diary, he was imprisoned by the British in 1922 for civil disobedient movement. This On the 24th January 1922, recording. he makes the following note in his diary. He was clever enough to see that the movement for which he was imprisoned would succeed one day and hopefully in his own lifetime. But he also knew that when it succeeds, people will not act in a manner which would make them deserve their freedom. And I'm quoting these words because they are of, an, of a great Indian patriot. And some of you may be old enough to know from personal experience that what he said is correct. These are Raja Gopalachari's words in 1922 when he envisage the future of India with Swaraj and, and independence. He says when Swaraj comes, elections and their corruptions, injustice and the power and tyranny of wealth and inefficiency of administration will make a hell of life as soon as freedom is given to us. Men will look regretfully back to the old regime of comparative justice an efficient, peaceful, more or less honest administration. The only thing gained will be that as a race, we will be saved from dishonor and subordination. Hope lies only in universal education, by which right conduct, fear of God, and love will be developed among the citizens from childhood. It is only if we succeed in this that Swaraj will mean happiness. Otherwise, it will mean the grinding injustices and tyranny of wealth. What a beautiful world it would be if everybody were just and God-fearing and realized the happiness of loving others. Yet, there is more practical is hope for India the ultimate consummation recording. of this ideal in India than elsewhere. He is quite right. If ever the ideal of love and, and humanity is developed in young ones, perhaps there is a greater hope for it in this country than anywhere else because of our priceless cultural heritage. I now quote the words which are a little long, but they need to be quoted in extenso. The words of Sardar Patel when he gave the address on the 15th August 1950, the last Independence Day that he ever saw. I quote his words, certain tendencies and developments in our administrative and public affairs fill me with some disquiet and sadness of heart. The country can realize the feelings of one who has spent the major part of his public life in witnessing epics of sacrifice and selfless endeavor and feats of discipline and unity and who now finds enacted before him scenes which mock at the past. Our public life seems to be degenerating into a fan of stagnant waters. Our conscience is troubled with doubts and despair about the possibilities of improvement. We do not seem to be profiting either from history or experience. We appear helplessly to be watching the sickle of time taking away the rich corn, leaving behind the bare and withered stalks. Yet, the tasks that confront us are as complex and taxing as ever. They demand the best in us while we face them with indifferent resources. We seem to devote too much time to things that hardly matter and too little to those that count. We talk while the paramount need is that of action. We are critical of other people's exertions, but lack the will to contribute our own. We are trying to overtake others by giant strides, while we have hardly learned to walk. On this third milestone of our career as a free country, 
I hope my countrymen will forgive me if I have tried to turn the searchlight inwards. In my life, I have now reached the stage when time is of the essence. Age has not diminished the passion which I bear to see my country great and to ensure that the foundations of our freedom are well and securely laid. Bodily infirmity has not dimmed my ardor to exert my utmost for the peace, prosperity, and advancement of the motherland. But the bird of time has a little way to fly, and lo, it is on the wing. With all the sincerity and earnestness at my command, and claiming the privilege of age, I therefore appeal to my fellow countrymen on this solemn and auspicious occasion to reflect on what they see in and around them. And with the strength and faith that comes from self-introspection, sustain the hope and confidence which an old servant of theirs still has in the future of our country." Unquote. These are beautiful words. He had the strength to speak out bluntly and fearlessly to his own party. At the Nasik session of the Congress, he never changed his party. From the first to the last, this he was a Congress. Uh, At the Nasik session of the Congress on 19 September 1950, he said, The goal of Purna Swaraj must claim our constant attention. The question which every congressman must ask himself or herself is, whether we have met this claim or demand. If we are honest with ourselves and true to our conscience, I am afraid the reply must be in the negative. The greatest danger to the Congress, mark the words, the greatest danger to the Congress comes from within rather than without, unquote. Our greatest tragedy is that the lessons taught by this outstanding Indian patriot and statesman who unquestionably ranks in the world class, are so little remembered today. Winston Churchill said that one of the marks of true greatness is the impact which a man makes on his contemporaries. By this test, Sardar Patel must be regarded as one of the greatest Indians of this century. Jawaharlal is a thinker. The Sardar is a doer, said Gandhiji at the Karachi session of the Congress in 1931. The Sardar was not only a doer, but he was also a thinker, though not an impractical visionary. Lord Wevel, the Viceroy, wrote in his diary that Sardar Patel is certainly, I'm quoting his words, is certainly the most impressive of the Congress leaders and has the best balance, unquote. The Sardar shared Wevel's belief that India can be governed firmly or not at all. President Rajendra Prasad wrote in May 1959 that there is today an India to think of and talk about is very largely due to Sardar Patel's statesmanship and firm administration. Record. Yet we are apt to ignore him. The India of today is certainly not the India of Sardar Patel's dreams. After five and forty years of independence, the picture that emerges is that of a nation potentially great, but in a state of moral decay. We suffer from a fatty degeneration of conscience and an unchecked dissolution of values. We have no sense of shame or shock that under a first-class constitution, we run a third-class democracy. I've had the uh, temerity to make this statement because as I read Sadar Patel's words, which were uttered at a time when the moral degradation was not as great as it is today, he virtually suggested that it was not a first-class democracy. If in those days it was not, consider what you would call this democracy today. The country with the noblest cultural heritage has become the most criminalized and the most violent democracy on earth. What a transformation could be effected if we relearn the values which Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel stood for. The environment will change beyond recognition when we install Dharma on the throne again. 
The country is crying aloud for moral leadership, fearless and forthright, which will tell the people, as Sardar Patel did, what does not flatter them and what they do not want to hear. Just as we celebrate the 15th August as the Day of Independence, we should celebrate the anniversary of Sardar Patel's birth, 31st October, as the Day of Interdependence. The dependence of the 26 states upon one another. The dependence of our manifold communities upon one another. The dependence of the numerous castes upon one another. In the sure knowledge that we are one nation. A regenerated India, freed from petty squabbles, violence and communal bitterness and cured of the cancer of divisiveness would be the greatest monument to the Sardar's memory. Thank you.